Jessica Wilson. I'm the executive director of Mill City Grows. And we've been here in Lowell for almost 10 years. And our goal is um, to bring food justice to the, all the residents of Lowell. And so what food justice means is that um, everybody in the community has the right to healthy food and that they're able to grow it. They're able to um, access it, eat it, cook it um, in a way that's you know, accessible and affordable for people. Um, that includes vegetables that are representative of different people's uh, home cultures, and that it really um, is grown in a way that's sustainable for the environment. And so that, you know, is what we've tried to do since our inception. And we do that in a lot of different ways um, through, you know, urban farming, um, distributing vegetables through a mobile market that goes into neighborhoods where there aren't grocery stores, uh, making community gardens available to people, and then also providing education for people of all ages on how to grow and prepare. Um, we have been really concerned about, um, you know, making sure everyone who on our staff and everyone who participates in our program stays safe since, um, you know, we first understood what COVID was. Um, and, you know, probably in the weeks prior to the official shutdown, um, we kind of, we came together as a staff and spent a couple of days actually writing policies based on um, CDC guidelines and Mass Department of Health guidelines. So we, we read them front to back um, <laughs> right out the gate. So that it was really, you know, if we knew if we wanted to keep, um, to keep working, we really had to keep everyone safe. We wear masks inside, we do, we have hand washing stations, we social distance and we're, you know, all of our meetings are virtual. So that's just, you know, in order to keep our staff healthy. Our gardens have been open um, through this entire season and we have limited the number of people who can be in a garden at a time, um, required mask wearing in the gardens and provided lots of sanitizing products in the gardens. So everybody, you know, is to wash their hands when they come and leave. Um, and there's uh, bleach and, and different um, kinds of cleaning products for all of the shared tools. And um, we just, you know, our, we have a, uh, actually got in touch with every single one of our gardeners one-on-one -on -one to let them know these new guidelines because we didn't have any opening day meetings as we usually do. For all of our kind of food production and distribution, um, this is limited to a very specific team um, on our staff. So our farm team, our market team, and our education team, which is overseeing the, the CSA distribution. Um, so we've limited who has access to our farms and um, who has access to our cooler and our storage space. And whenever food is handled, masks are worn, gloves are worn, and there's, you know, lots of hand washing before and after. Um, but all the, the produce is packed, you know, with all of those things going on. Um, and then it's distributed through the online system or at our mobile markets. And so when we decided to open our markets, which we opened in July, which is much later than we normally do, um, we usually start the, our outdoor markets in May. Um, we worked with the Department of Public Health. Um, we created some guidelines and all of that was approved before we were able to open. And it included, you know, protocols for um, educating the consumers, um, providing masks for all the consumers if they didn't have one. Um, we have signage for social distancing. And I think at one market, we actually um, are working with another vendor and they um, speak Khmer, so they're able to offer some Khmer translation and interpretation um, at that market. And we have, um, all of our flyers actually have been translated with all of our guidelines. So we, um, you know, we pass these out there in English, Spanish, Khmer, I, I believe Portuguese, and um, we've done a couple of other languages as they're requested. And so that's been really helpful, so we can share that with everyone. Um, and at the market, um, transactions are done one at a time. There's a different person handling produce than is um, handling money. Um, our staff are wearing masks and gloves. The consumers are wearing masks. Um, and we have a hand washing station and um, hand sanitizer that's available. So, uh, and it's, everything is outdoors. So we are trying to, you know, do our best to make sure that when people come and buy their produce, they feel like we're taking really good care of them. Um, and that we're creating an environment that feels safe for people and it's not, you know, so we're not allowing crowding or anything like that. And there's usually, I think at one of the more busy markets, there's somebody that's actually like sharing these. In the after school program, we don't see as much of the parents, but we've invited them to come in 
um, like when we have kind of the end of semester or end of trimester party, and they've been able to see some of the things that the students have made and done. And I think the general consensus of the parents is that um, they're so impressed that their children who are, you know, maybe not great chefs at home are actually in this after school program, like making food and learning how to do, you know, I think making butter and making pickles is not something that most people do in their home kitchens. And so the fact that they've learned some of these, you know, more, um, you know, unconventional, like food prep and food science techniques is really, you know, the, the parents are really excited um, that the kids have these skills. And I think that, um, you know, we try to understand like, you know, the different cultures that the students come from and learn from them about what kind of foods they eat. And I think that some of the parents have really appreciated that, you know, their, their students are able to bring some of their, their home culture, their personal culture into class and that it's really celebrated in this way. Um, we do actually have a program called the, the Farm to Table Cooking Classes. And these have, of course have been on hiatus um, since last year. Um, well, actually since the beginning of this year, last school year, but those classes is an opportunity for us to get to know the families of the students really well. So what we do is we will meet um, about four or five weeks in a row with the students and their families. Um, we bring all the, the produce and the ingredients we meet. We've done this class in um, like a lot of school cafeterias in the evening time. We'll work on, you know, four or five different recipes, all plant-based and we have dinner with all the families. And so every member of the family is a part of that class. Every member of the family has a job to do to prepare the food. Um, and every member of the family has a responsibility and gets to learn something new and a different way to contribute to the meal. Um, and that, you know, for, for a lot of working parents, like that's been amazing for them to have that, that help and that interest of their students in the kitchen. Um, a lot of parents have told us they're able to you know, eat healthier at home and people are, you know, that that's really making them feel great, that they're, be, they're able to offer their families things that they wanna eat and that they also know are really good for them. Um, we had one, this, this story actually was really remarkable. One mom, her um, young son was on the spectrum. He was very picky about what he ate. And I think his, his diet was something like chicken nuggets and french fries and that was it. Um, and mom, you know, really wanted to try to get him to eat healthier things. She wanted to eat more produce, but she didn't want to cook two separate dinners. So she was eating French fries and chicken nuggets too. Um, and she was kind of willing to try anything to sort of help diversify that diet. And so she brought her son to this class and, you know, through the process of touching and feeling and tasting things and really having some ownership about making the, the, um, the meals her son all of a sudden got really interested in vegetables and he, his new favorite food became kale, like magically kale of all things. Um, and it was his favorite thing to make and he would, um, you know, want to make dinner at home. And it really became, you know, I think what had become a, a real slog for her was this kind of like monotonous cuisine at home. Um, actually, like there was some variety and there was some interest and she, you know, she was so excited that, and I think that's probably one of like, I, you know, not every family comes in and this miraculous change occurs after this class, but that's one of the stories that's really always stuck out to me because um, it was the vehicle for like this change that mom had tried so many different things to get this change to happen. And that like, what we found is having people come together and cook and putting kids in the driver's seat of making the meal has really helped parents to change what their, you know, their home food culture is like. So the idea behind the mobile market was um, there are a lot of neighborhoods in Lowell where there's not a full grocery service, uh, full service grocery store in walking distance. Um, and in an urban community, um, an area is considered low income, low access if there's not a grocery store within, I think, a half mile, um, because a lot of people are, you know, they don't necessarily have cars, and so they're looking for places where they can take a cab or they can walk. Um, so we created the mobile market so that we could help create food access in neighborhoods where there wasn't enough access to those those fresh foods. And um, you know, one of the things that we did when before our co-founders, you know, created Mill City Gross, is we did a, a survey of a community food assessment here in Lowell of you know what people wanted to eat, where they were getting it, and what they were lacking. 
And what we learned was that most people are purchasing their food at a corner store or a bodega. Um, because that's the closest store in their neighborhood. And that at those stores, there are generally less than three types of produce on offer. And all of them are at prices um, up to three times higher than you would find in a grocery store. So that's really limiting the amount of produce that people get um, off the bat. So that was really, our answer was we create this mobile market and it goes right into um, neighborhoods where people can come, you know, by foot, purchase what they need. We take um, SNAP and we also honor HIP, which is the Healthy Incentive Program. That's something that's um, offered here in Massachusetts. And it allows anybody who is a SNAP user um, that's purchasing fresh produce directly from a farmer, they can get reimbursed between $40 and $80. So that means that above and beyond the amount of money they get from SNAP per month, they get an extra forty to eighty dollars just for produce, um, and that means that you know we these types of produce programs have been tested in other areas of the country, and they found again and again that with these incentives, people actually do eat, not just purchase, because we all know you know you purchase produce sometimes it sits in the refrigerator and you're like I don't have time to cook those green beans, um, and they go bad. But that people are not just purchasing, but actually eating more fresh vegetables and fruit. Um, so we, we are really grateful for that program. So this year, all of our events um, have been virtual. We actually, I think the shutdown occurred a few weeks before we were going to hold our seed swap. <laughs> um, so we actually had, you know, we had flyers out, we had everything planned. And really rapidly, we had to figure out how we were, I mean, we had literally gotten, I think, like three or $4,000 worth of seeds already donated. So we had everything ready to go. Um, so what we did instead, we um, created an online order form. We got in touch with all of the gardeners. Also make um, the seeds available to anybody in the community that wants them. So we took the, these online order forms and then we um, created places where people could pick them up. So they could either pick them up directly in the gardens where they garden, or they could pick them up from our office. Um, and we I think we distributed seeds to um, def definitely over like 200 folks um, through that. So that was actually re really great. So we kind of figured that one out. We, <laughs> we had, you know, like a week and a half to figure out how we were going to do it. Um, we had a little bit more lead time with, we hold um, an annual fundraising event called Farm to Cocktail. Um, that's usually around the summer solstice in June. And I think before we really understood that how long um, these kind of new COVID guidelines would go on, we made the decision like we, we needed to go virtual because we didn't want to take any chances and we didn't want to put a lot of time and money into planning um, an in-person event that wasn't going to happen. It just didn't seem like a good return on investment for us. So we, we created... Um, a Zoom event for that. And that was actually really fun. Um, it was kind of, it was a great like exercise and creativity to figure out how we could turn, you know, a cocktail party um, into something that people could do from home. So we um, offered these like, kind of like take your party home with you kits that were full of all the ingredients you needed to make your hors d'oeuvres, your dessert, and your cocktails. Um, and then we actually posted videos on how to do it yourself at home. We had a recipe book that people could have. And then we had a, an online event um, where we talked about all the, the things that we'd been doing um, that people, you know, unfortunately hadn't been able to engage with us um, and let them know how we were, you know, producing more food and getting it out to people um, and pivoting our work in the school gardens. And, and it was an opportunity for us to connect with folks that we usually get to see. Um, in person. So it was, it was really nice and it was incredibly successful. We raised over $30,000 and that was part of the campaign that supported um, us being able to, to give these farm shares to folks who need them. And our final, you know, big event of the year is Harvest Festival. So this is usually a big free festival we host. Um, we've hosted it at a different city park over the years. Um, we usually have this in North Common over the past few years. And it's almost like, you know, like a country fall fair that we hold in the middle of the city of Lowell and it's free to anybody who wants to come. Um, we give tours of our garden, we have you know performances and art throughout the day, um, lots of activities for kids, we do like pumpkin painting and um, you know 
like apple stamping and different food trials so people can try like fresh popcorn, fresh apple cider, um, different things like that. So it is a lot of fun. And I'm actually, you know, it's one of the things I really look forward to in the fall is like fall festivals. So it was, it's, um, you know, it's hard for us to decide not to do it this year, but what we're doing um, is having just kind of two weeks of online storytelling about, um, you know, everything that's happening in Lowell around the harvest and doing some education for folks around like preserving the harvest so that you'll be able to eat like those gorgeous canned tomatoes and homemade pickles throughout the fall and the winter. Um, so those are our major events. And then we have done um, a few like kind of cooking videos online that we've shared with people and some tutorials about how to start seeds in the spring. Um, and I think that's something, you know, we've really enjoyed doing it. And now as we're going into winter, we're thinking about how we can integrate this into our programming long term. So that way, you know, we, we've always been really dedicated to working um, here with people in Lowell, but we'd love to be able to share some of the things that we've learned wider than that. So whether or not, you know, like we want to get back together with our community as soon as possible, but um, I think doing some things virtually will allow us to share them far and wide. And that I think can be beneficial for other communities too. So, you know, far beyond the, you know, COVID and this year, um, we'll still be able to do those things with people. So we have, um, we've helped to build gardens in 13 of the public schools here in Lowell. And um, they all kind of came about over, I think maybe a three and a half year period. Um, and a lot of the funding that um, was used for that came from a, a grant from the USDA. Um, it was called the Farm to School Program. And so when that program was first initiated, it was uh, you know, a lot about um, food education. Those in, um, we offer um, support and professional development to the staff in all 13 of those schools. Um, and we actually have a school garden coordinator who does um, landscaping support. She you know, works in the gardens and helps maintain them answer any questions um, that the teachers may have. But we really want the, the schools to take ownership of those gardens and use them um, in the best way that they see fit to educate the, the students in their schools. And so, um, you know, they've used the gardens to do projects in um, science and math and language. We, you know, one school there were phys ed teachers who would use the garden and have like their phys ed classes out there doing different things. Um, they're great you know, as kind of like a learning lab to learn about measurement or to, do, you know, test hypotheses and things like that. So every, the way every school uses them is a little bit different. Well, in the spring and the fall, we spend a lot of time in the after school programs in the gardens. And in the winter, um, we do a lot of cooking and um, food science indoors. So like the students will learn how to make pickles or, um, you know, I think in, we even, you know, we go off of produce, we do some work with dairy, we learned about like how butter is made and, you know, all these different processes. So, and I've noticed, you know, the students get really into it. Um, they learn new recipes in the class and then they try them out with their families over the holidays and come back and report on what they made. And it's really interesting to see, um, you know, these young students who like maybe hadn't eaten radishes before, like get really excited about them and want to make them for their, their parents for like whatever holiday they celebrate. Um, so that's some of the work we've been doing. And then this past year, we actually have this amazing partnership um, with the Lowell, food, Lowell Public Schools Food and Nutrition. Um, so all of the, the food services. And we, um, we've been working with them on this um, Lowell Farm to School program. And so what that is really focused on, um, you know, creating an education space within the, the cafeteria, within food services and, you know, trying local foods. And so one of the things that we do in that partnership is we help support this program called Harvest of the Month. And every month there's a different type of food that is grown or um, harvested in Massachusetts. Um, and we create a recipe with the food services and taste test it with the, the students and they get to vote on whether or not they like it. And if it's something that a majority of the students like, then the food, um, low food nutrition can actually integrate it into the menu in the cafeteria. So it's actually a really interesting way for like the kids to get involved in what they're eating. And so of course, as you can imagine, 
Um, those programs were all a little bit different at the end of last school year and then going into this school year because of remote learning. Um, so instead of having kids out in the garden um, last year, one of the projects that we did was we created these um, seed starting kits that kids could take home with them. Um, and a lot of students were coming in, you know, to pick up their learning packets or to pick up food. So there's a, like a food distribution program at um, Lowell Public Schools this year. And they would pick up these packets and then they could start seeds at home. And so, you know, it was part science experiment and also part, you know, ha having kids have an opportunity to grow their own food over the summer at home. And we, we worked with a lot of volunteers to put those kits together. And I believe we, um, we distributed like 2,500 kits to the second and third graders in little public schools. So it, it was, you know, this past year has been so different and we really wanted to support um, of the families in Lowell however we could in whatever way made sense and we were really hopeful that you know this uh, this kind of a project would give kids something to do a reason to get outside something fun to do with their parents and hopefully a way for them to try some new foods if they're they were successful with their plantings um and then we are really you know working closely with Lowell public schools to figure out how the gardens will come into play in this new school year, if we can, you know, get more kids that are um, doing the in-school learning into the gardens, because outdoors is a great place to learn um, while the weather is good. And then over the summer, um, we actually use the gardens to grow food for several families in Lowell Public Schools. So some of our staff were out in the school gardens every single day. Um, there were four gardens where we were growing. Not all of them were accessible to us because some of them are within the school property. So we, and that space was off limits. Um, schools were closed to any anybody outside just for safety. Um, and so we we did get into some of the gardens and we were able to provide, um, I think, three uh, 3,000 pounds of food we grew in those gardens this summer. Um, and all of that was distributed to families um, with children in the little public schools to help them, you know, access food throughout the summer. Just to give you like kind of a sense of scale, um, we do also have an urban farm and on the farm, which operates, um, you know, we start in, some, in March and April, we go through November or whenever the first frost is, and then we do some growing in the winter in a greenhouse, but it's a much smaller scale. Um, we aim to harvest about 40,000 pounds from that farm. And so being able to grow 3,000 pounds in a school garden, which is about nine that nine raised beds is pretty incredible. Um, so we love our volunteers so much. Um, we, I, I think from the beginning, we would not have ever been able to do all the things we've done without the help of so many people who volunteered, um, whether it's you know building a garden, repairing gardens, um, helping us out at the farm. So we, we are really happy that we're able to work with some volunteers now. So. This year, we actually have a brand new position. Um, our outreach and volunteer manager, uh, Dai Kim, who joined us, um, he literally started, I think, at the beginning of March. So he's had a very weird first year on the job. Um, but we can put people in touch with Dai. And the first thing that he will do, he actually has like a survey. So he wants to gauge um, what level of contact people are comfortable with when they're doing their volunteering. And then we try to find an opportunity for folks, whether it's something they can do remotely, something they can do outdoors, or something where they will have contact, um, but masked with other folks. And um, we do have the, so we've done a lot of um, school garden cleanup days and volunteers have helped us with those, which has been amazing. And those are kind of scheduled as they, they're, I think most of them are Wednesday morning, but they've been scheduled on other days as well. Um, and we've had some, a variety of remote um, volunteer opportunities, and those are usually things that people do, you know, on their own. But we had several volunteers that helped us put together those seed starting kits for um, students. And um, we have some folks who do some, some help with administrative and fundraising tasks with us. And um, then we have, you know, our a group of people that come every week to the farm um, and we can always welcome some more folks to do that. So those are some, some of the different things that we're doing right now. We, we did kind of like, we turned volunteering off for a few months before we figured out how to do this safely. But it's been, I think, a great opportunity. We have a lot of folks that are coming out that, you know, suddenly because of COVID, like they have a lot of time and they wanna give back. 
um, to the community. So it's really, I think it's awesome that there's a way that they can, you know, get outside, get some exercise, get some fresh air, get dirty. Um, and they're really, you know, helping us to, to feed people in their community. So that's great. Um, so if people are interested, they can contact either info at millcitygrows.org or volunteers at millcitygrows.org. Just uh, shoot us an email and we'll get you some more information.